Michelle, it's been an unsettling day for people who live in this area, for those who woke up to the sounds of gunshots, and for those who had to stay in homes to keep safe. What followed was a heavy police presence. First came the gunshots, ringing out on the street Easter Monday, just after 8 in the morning, seriously injuring a man in his 50s. Just out of nowhere, I hear like loud pops and bangs, and it's like kind of like evenly spaced pop, 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 pop. Probably about 10 shots, and my son came running in, extremely alarmed and wound up. Then shortly before 10, for the next two hours, Toronto police told people living and walking in the area of Hampton Park Crescent and True Davidson Drive to shelter in place. Gun officers say out of an abundance of caution, so police dogs and members of the emergency task force could safely search the area after a report about a possible suspect in a backyard. Uh, we are disturbed by the event, absolutely. This man and his family followed the order to stay inside. He says in 15 years of living here, nothing like this has ever happened. It's not something you can ever prepare for. It's not something that you expect. This cluster of large homes is nestled next to the Don Valley Ravine system near Bayview, south of Moore, tucked into a cul-de-sac, an affluent area known as Governor's Bridge. Whatever sparked the gun violence here, officers say it wasn't a carjacking or a home invasion, and the man shot wasn't intervening to try and stop a criminal act. I heard the gunshots, which sounded like they were just outside my window. And uh, I have a window in the front, so just jumped up five seconds later. And at that point, I saw a guy running towards his car. Residents say there have been more break-ins and car thefts, but not this type of violence. Uh, that this is easy picking for, for cars, jewelry, you know, and, and that's been disturbing. Police say after an extensive search, no one was located, but around five, this tan sedan with bullet holes was hauled away by police as evidence. To give you a sense of the feeling that already existed here, some residents tell me a private security firm had been hired to start patrols this week. Tonight, police say a witness reported a blue Honda CRV fleeing the scene, and tonight there is no suspect description. Reporting live, I'm Beth Magdanell. Michelle, back to you. Apparently, uh, an individual had tried to make entry to the home, had encountered some smoke, heard some alarms, felt heat coming from the second story, uh, called 911.
Nathan Michel, organizers are accusing Toronto police of planning in advance the use of excessive force against protesters and selectively choosing to enforce laws, allegations being rejected by police. Video shows pro-Palestinian demonstrators and police clashing at Girard in Parliament on Saturday as Toronto police move in and make several arrests, including two people for assaulting officers. United will never be defeated! Outside police headquarters today. These escalations are in an attempt to criminalize and intimidate pro-Palestinian protesters off the streets. Rally organizers criticizing police tactics. This was not policing. This was premeditated, pre-planned police brutality. Accusing police of kettling demonstrators. This man claims he was forcefully detained. They left us with nowhere to go and I was grabbed by my head, pushed over the police line, forcibly thrown to the ground and I just felt several bodies on top of me. Toronto police say matters escalated when officers charged the driver of a truck involved in the protest with stunt driving for having people on its bed while it was moving adding they had repeatedly warned the driver not to do so. Police say the driver was not cooperating, and when officers attempted to secure the vehicle, demonstrators resorted to physical aggression against officers. Police charged one woman for throwing horse manure at an officer. Another woman was charged for allegedly using a flagpole to intentionally spear an officer. Police say their presence at this protest mirrored past demonstrations with officers and the mounted unit assisting with crowd control, stating the fundamental difference lies in demonstrators' refusal to adhere to police directives despite clear forewarning. Police employed appropriate and necessary force to preserve public and officer safety while maintaining order during protest activity, particularly when faced with violence and aggression. After hearing what our community had said, who our community members had said who were brutalized by the police, uh, I would question any and every account that the Toronto police puts out there. The president of the Toronto Police Association defending the actions of his members. The officers have been very, very patient. But the reality is these protests are getting more violent. Uh, the people are becoming more aggressive with the police officers and confrontational. The Prime Minister responding today. People are allowed to express their concerns on every side of the event. We expect people to obey the law. We expect the police to obey the law, but we also expect the police to enforce the law. Rally organizers calling for police to be defunded and vowing to continue to mobilize. Police have also said that protesters were free to leave at any time. Organizers are calling for an independent civilian investigation into the matter. Reporting live, I'm Mike Walker. Nathan, back to you. know that when kids eat better, they do better in school. The teachers, advocates and volunteers I spoke with today know that and it's something I remember from my years as a teacher. When a kid walks up before class and says, I'm hungry, that means we all have more work to do as a school community, as a country, as a world.
for the parents, it takes off that pressure, that guilt and that worry that their kids aren't getting the best meal possible packed for them to go to school. And it's going to save families money. It's going to make sure that those families are actually going to have a bit of a break. In contrast to that, while we know that families right now, we're seeing record food bank usage, highest since 1989. We're seeing millions of kids now in poverty because of the cost of living being so high. And what is the response of the Liberals? Again, they've ignored this problem. They've promised and then broken the promise of bringing in a national food program. Overnight, the price at the pump jumped as the cost of Canada's carbon tax did too. It just means that the price of, of everything is, is going to go up. Uh, when the price of fuel goes up, everything moves with the price of fuel, so uh, the price of everything is going to increase as well. I can't pay my bills and uh, taxes and buy food because it's too much. The government says its carbon pricing system is necessary to cut down emissions and reach net zero goals by 2050. As part of that plan, a yearly increase took place today. The carbon tax is now $80 per tonne of carbon emissions, up from $65. That translates into an extra 3.3 cents a litre for gasoline, 4.1 cents a litre for diesel, 2.3 cents a litre for propane, and 2.9 cents per cubic metre of natural gas. Any elevated price has an impact not just on the cost of energy, but ultimately on the cost of uh, inflation uh, and the effect it's having uh, rolling over month to month. The Liberals say any increase is offset by quarterly carbon rebates of up to $450 per family of four. But at least seven premiers say the hike is unnecessary and costing citizens already struggling with an affordability crisis. One of those leaders, Newfoundland Premier Andrew Fury, who wrote to the Prime Minister today asking for a meeting to discuss alternatives to the carbon tax. So all those premiers that are busy complaining about the price on pollution, but not putting forward a concrete alternative that they think would be better for their communities, are just plain politics. In Alberta, consumers are facing a double win. Not only is the carbon tax increasing, the province's own gas tax is going up four cents per litre. That hike will bring in an extra $1.4 billion in revenue. We live in a country that's being taxed to death. Carbon is the greatest thing on the planet. We need carbon dioxide to make the world go around. You can't tax it, you can't call it pollution, it's not. And like those Alberta protesters, the Conservative leader wants to see the carbon tax axed altogether. You tax the, the fuel of the farmer who grows the food and the trucker who ships the food, you're taxing all who buy the food. This will kill jobs. It'll vaporize about $18 billion of our GDP. Another cost to consumers, the federal sales tax, and that applies on top of the carbon tax. The parliamentary budget officer estimates that Ottawa could generate nearly $600 million in extra GST this year alone. Annie Bergeron-Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. Well, Nathan and Michelle, if you think that anybody in this gas line would land on one side, there are actually just as many opinions as there are cars waiting to fill up right now. The April increase in the carbon tax is most apparent right here at the pumps. How people feel about it varies. I think they should scrap it altogether. I think it should be even higher. I think it's garbage. I think it sucks that we have a carbon tax and we don't have like cap and trade like we're supposed to. It is what it is. I got to get around. I got to drive. At most GTA stations today, the price of gas was hovering around $1.62 per litre. This Costco gas bar along the Queensway was about $0.08 cents a litre cheaper, resulting in long lines. The rebate is probably more than what I pay on the tax. They keep saying they give you back, but you don't get back what you pay. Today's increase in the carbon tax works out to about $0.03 cents a litre, bringing the total amount of carbon tax to around $0.20 cents a litre money the government returns to Canadians in the form of a carbon rebate. It's a tough thing 
for people to buy. They feel the sting of the tax being paid at, at the pump in immediate terms. And that tough sell is what some are talking about here. Because I don't know how it helps me. You know, I think it's, if you want to help the environment, you should try to invest more in, in um, electric vehicles. Half the people in these lines think that, you know, they're being robbed and uh, most of them are getting back more from the federal rebate anyway. And Trudeau government is at fault for not making it better understood, for sure. As the price of gas went up today, experts say it's only part of a much steeper climb as we enter summer driving. And prices probably won't stop here. They could continue going up another five to ten cents over the next few weeks. When asked if anyone's changing their habits because of the carbon tax? Not yet, but I think we're probably going to have to start soon. I'll just drive less and t t use the TTC. How can we? We have bills to pay. Uh, uh, if the carbon tax goes up, gas goes up, food price goes up, we still got to work. And the vehicles keep rolling to the pump. And some of the experts we spoke to say that the price of gasoline will be going up in the short term, as you heard during the story, because we're transitioning from that winter gasoline into summer gasoline. When they expect the price to actually go down, couldn't be until maybe the fall. But at that time, they could see it going down as much as 30 or 40 cents. Reporting live, I'm Sean Nithong. Michelle, send it back to you. government policies that bring any more costs down to our industry. We've got 62% of the industry that's operating at a loss or barely breaking even, and that was 12% before the pandemic. So the entire industry has seen drastic increases in operations from everything, food, of course, we've all seen this, but they've got high jumps in commercial uh, insurance costs. They've seen jumps in, in their labor costs. They've seen it across the board.
Demolition crews were back at the site of the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge today, removing debris as part of the complicated and extensive cleanup process, a process that could help open up a temporary channel. This will be for vessels that don't draw as much water, so about 11 feet, as work goes on at the same time to clear the main channel. That's 50 feet, and that's the channel we have to clear to get more container ships back into the port. Uh, of Baltimore. The Port of Baltimore is one of the busiest in the U.S. and opening an alternate channel which would allow commercially essential vehicles to reach the port would be a major step forward in recovery for the community. It is a critical, critical economic hub. We've got to get this up and running. Six people were on the bridge when it collapsed in the early morning hours last Tuesday. The bodies of four of them have yet to be recovered. Authorities believe they are trapped in the tangle of steel and concrete underwater that crews are working to remove. This is a steel bridge that is sitting on top of a container ship in the middle of the Patapsco River. We are talking about tons of steel that is mangled and cantilevered. We're talking about water that is so murky and so filled with debris that divers cannot see any more than a foot or two in front of them. Larry DeSantis believes he was one of the last people to drive over the bridge before a massive container ship ran into it. He was heading to work that morning, crossing the bridge likely seconds before it came down. It took a while for it to really sink in, you know, because it's the initial shock of it, but then more and more people are calling me to see if I'm alive, you know, because they knew I traveled that time in the morning over the bridge. DeSantis is emotional when thinking of the six construction workers killed in the incident. I feel sorry for those workers, I really do. I mean, they're doing their job, but, you know, they lost their lives. So it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, I, you know, I rode right by them, you know, I saw all of them. You know, just a minute before they probably died. It was pretty heartbreaking. It was a verbal attack Patty Jacobs hoped would never be thrown at her own child. A racist slur her 16-year-old son, JJ, claims an opposing player made against him during a minor hockey game in New Hamburg early last month. JJ told us um, that the player called him um, said, good job, little black boy, and then the N-word. New Hamburg Firebirds head coach Zach Mark witnessed the on-ice altercation from the bench. J.J. countered with a profanity-laced response to the player, accusing him of being racist. I can tell you that this isn't the first time that this has happened to him, but I was really happy that he actually spoke up and said something this time. What followed was a swift response 
from the Ontario Minor Hockey Association. Hey, they just suspended JJ for seven games. I was like, for for what? Jacobs filed an appeal to have the suspension reduced. In a statement to CTV News, the OMHA said in part, the player who made a discriminatory slur has been handed a seven-game suspension. The other player who responded received a three-game suspension that was reduced from an original ruling of seven games. So you're holding racism to the same standpoint as calling a guy racist. The decision drawing backlash. Every situation is unique and different. And I think they looked at this from a very blanketed perspective. JJ returned to hockey this season after a heart condition kept him out of competitive sports for three years. The suspension forcing him to miss the OMHA championships and ending his minor hockey career. The greater concern, the acts of hate still being felt in minor hockey and what's being done about it. It should be a game that's inclusive for all and it should be a game that should be able to be played by all and this just does not support that whatsoever. Tyler Kelleher, CTV News.
there's been a dramatic increase in youth vaping. We've made progress to reduce youth smoking, but now a new generation of kids are becoming hooked on nicotine as a result of e-cigarettes. The Canadian Cancer Society says that's despite falling smoking rates among adults. And the report, entitled Balancing Act from Dr. Kieran Moore, says the health costs down the line will be high for conditions such as heart disease, cancer and emphysema. Among the recommendations, raising the minimum age to purchase tobacco and vaping products from 19 to 21, as PEI in 30 U.S. states have already done. There's a U.S. study that found that increasing the minimum age from 18 to 21 uh, nationwide would reduce youth smoking by 25% among 15 to 17 year olds and by 15% among 18 to 19 year olds. Rob Cunningham says the overwhelming majority of smokers began as underage youth and surveys have shown the majority of Canadians support raising the age. Dr. Moore also recommends raising taxes to match inflation rates. Higher tobacco taxes are the most effective strategy to reduce smoking, especially among youth. Youth are more responsive to price increases. Ontario and Quebec have the lowest uh, tax rates in Canada uh, for tobacco. Ontario has not increased its tax rates in six years since 2018. The report also supports banning flavoured vaping products, as has already been done in six provinces, and banning disposable e-cigarettes. And it recommends limiting tobacco and e-cigarette stores. This report recommends what some U.S. cities have already done, such as San Francisco and Philadelphia, to no longer have new cigarette stores near an existing store or near a school. And over time, that's going to reduce the number of stores that sell cigarettes. The Canadian Cancer Society is urging Federal Health Minister Sylvia Jones to act on the report immediately. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Marking World Autism Day. From the impact on families to important resources, we'll have an open conversation with a pediatrician about where we stand in the province. CP24 Breakfast, where Toronto gets its everything every morning. I feel like loud pops and bangs, and it's like kind of like evenly spaced pop, 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 pop. This was not policing. This was premeditated, pre-planned police brutality. They should scrap it all together. I think it should be even higher. I think it's garbage. Montreal-based payment company Nuve is set to go private after receiving a takeover offer from New York-based bio firm 
Advent values the company at more than $6 billion U.S. New Bay went public less than four years ago and struggled after a meteoric rise in 2021. Last April, the company announced that Ryan Reynolds had become an investor and started to appear in the company's ads. Now, it was never disclosed how much or at what price Reynolds invested. However, the offer to buy the company today is lower than what it was when Reynolds first invested and well below the more than $20 billion the company was worth at its peak in 2021. Two new surveys by the Bank of Canada show business optimism is weak but improving with fewer firms expecting a recession. The surveys indicate that higher interest rates continue to weigh on business activity, but sales and hiring outlooks have become more positive. A separate survey showed that consumer sentiment improved in Q1, but is still weak. Officials at the bank are scheduled to announce their next interest rate decision next week. And just days after going public, shares of Donald Trump's media company plunged after the company warned it does not have sufficient funds to meet its obligations. Investors bid up the value of the company to more than $10 billion at one point last week, despite the company barely taking in $4 million in sales. Trump Media and Technology Group said in a regulatory filing on Monday that it lost nearly $60 million in the year up to December and that it expects that number to grow. Now let's take a look at some of the closing market numbers. The Canadian dollar slipped to below 74 cents U.S., while oil prices edged up in the U.S. to just under $84 per barrel. Meanwhile, Canadian energy prices finished just modestly below $70 per barrel, and the TSX closed up at an all-time high, its fourth this year. In the BNN Bloomberg Newsroom, I'm Amber Canwell. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Back it goes to Timmons, shooting, Matthews, there it is, number 16, the ninth player in NHL history to have multi-60 goal seasons. And now Schneider rips one to deep left field. Gone! And boy, is it that. Line drive, right field, base hit. Clement racing around third. He'll come in to score. In the third is Schneider. In the second is Vigio. Tonight, Ottawa looks to deliver on a long-standing promise to help feed kids. This need is far greater than anyone is able to meet right now. A billion dollars now on the table for a national school food program. Later on CTV National News.
Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. We've discovered a signal. She can feel it. Feel like I'm for a ride?